Right now, all over the world, scientists are attempting to crack the neural code. We're trying to understand the way that the brain processes and represents information. Because if we can truly understand the way that the brain learns and achieves things like creativity, then we can take those principles and we can reverse engineer them and we can apply them to technologies like artificial intelligence and hopefully design algorithms that make the world a better place, that solve problems that we thought were unsolvable. Now, my name is Taylor Guthrie and I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about three ways that this incredible burgeoning field that is computational neuroscience is gonna drastically change the way that the future looks. Things that we thought were science fiction could become possible in the next 10, 20 years. Now, if you don't know who Demis Hassabis is, you should probably look him up because he is going to drastically change the world as you know it. Now, he is the CEO of Google's artificial intelligence program, DeepMind. And he started as a video game programmer. He had a video game called Theme Park. He programmed these little artificial intelligent people to walk around the park and ride all the rides. But Demis knew that if he went to go learn how the brain worked, how the brain achieved things like learning and memory, that he could take those principles and bring them back and improve the way that artificial intelligence programming worked. And so that's what he did. He went to graduate school, he studied the hippocampus in the brain, which is responsible for learning and memory. And he found out that the brain uses this technique called reinforcement, where when it gets things right, it strengthens these connections and these neural networks that it maintains. And so when he left graduate school, he created this artificial intelligent algorithm called deep reinforcement learning that went on to achieve incredible things. I mean, still to this day, it's just achieving new things every day. But it started with AlphaGo. Uh, this was a program that was designed to play the board game Go, which is considered the most complicated game ever created by humans. And the artificial intelligence community thought we were a decade out on a program coming in and beating the best in the world at this board game. But here comes Demis Asabis with this deep reinforcement algorithm, and it blew the competition out of the game. This world champion said that the game wasn't even close the entire time. Now the coolest thing about this program, this artificial intelligence program, was that Demis didn't program in any of the rules of the game Go. It didn't tell this program how to play Go. It taught the program how to learn, how to learn the, like the brain learns. We don't have to, as humans, be told all the rules of life and all of these things. We learn by observing, by watching, and seeing other people do these things. And that's what this program did. It just watched game after game and after game, and it learned strategies as it watched. As things were done right and things were done wrong, it strengthened connections. Now, this same algorithm now is being applied to amazing things in the world. Alpha Fold is one of the newer versions that's uh, being used to discover the structure and the folding of proteins, which is a problem that it was the holy grail in biology. Like if, we, if we can truly understand the way that proteins, which are the main driver of function of life, if we can understand how they work, how they fold, how, they, how they're structured, then we can design new medicines. We can understand disease progression. Now the same algorithm, this deep reinforcement algorithm is now being used to predict weather patterns across the world. Something that's been really hard for us to predict with the methods we were using before. So you can see that just by applying these simple principles of how the brain learns, we've created this amazing new version of artificial intelligence that is getting better and better every day. Because Demis's true goal is to understand creativity how the brain, the human brain, is able to take things that it learns from other domains, from other problems, and bring those same skills to bear on new problems, to be creative in the way that it approaches new things. Because that's the holy grail for artificial intelligence, and that's what we're working towards. by talking about 
artificial intelligence and how the brain was sort of used as a template to create these programs is because you have to understand that the relationship between the artificial intelligent world, all of these programs that are being created, and the brain science world is very reciprocal. As artificial intelligent programs get better and better, those tools then become available to us as brain scientists to be able to use to understand the brain even better. To be able to use them to try to predict what all of this activity in the brain means. These billions of firing neurons that are happening every second. Despite that seeming very chaotic, these artificial intelligent programs can find structure within that. They can find meaning within that. Starting with simple kind of categorization type problems. Is the person looking at a house or are they looking at an animal? Right? And this program predicts, based on the brain activity, it looks like they're probably looking at a house. But then as things get even better, as these programs get smarter and smarter, moving on to identification. So instead of just asking, are they looking at a house or looking at an animal? You ask, what house are they looking at? Are they looking at the blue house with the yellow door? Are they looking at the Labrador retriever with the red collar? Just by looking at the brain activity, being able to predict what someone is looking at. Now, the ultimate goal is reconstruction. Taking someone's brain activity and recreating what it is they're thinking or what it is they're looking at, right? Now, there's a researcher named Jack Gallant whose lab is doing incredible things. I mean, among hundreds of other neuroscientists, he's just a very good example of this kind of stuff. But his lab is doing exactly this. He's putting people into a scanner, an MRI scanner, and recording their brain while they're watching videos or looking at pictures or thinking about different types of words and things like that. And just by looking at the brain activity, these computer programs that they use are able to start reconstructing what they were watching, the video they were watching. Predict what picture it is and recreate the picture that they were looking at. They can put word clouds up on a screen and have the, patient, have the participant think about a specific word. And as that person thinks about that word, the word in the word cloud starts to get bigger because the program has picked up on what brain activity means that word. Incredible. I mean, this is science fiction. It's mind reading, right? They call it brain decoding. And we're a far way off from actual mind reading, from being able to actually read someone's thoughts, someone's intentions, replay dreams and memories and things like that. But if these same principles are held up in different parts of the brain that control those types of things, and we're able to start looking into those regions, that stuff is possible. But you have to keep in mind, though, too, that this is all being done in a $2 million MRI scanner. We're not just able to read a random person on the street's brain activity without having putting them in this environment that allows us to do that. And so until the technology gets better and more portable, uh, some of those things are, are kind of off the table. But there are a lot of engineers and uh, technology type people that are working on, on improving those systems and creating portable scanning systems that can scan the brain. can use this technology to read your mind, so to say. It's pretty amazing that we can base these artificial intelligent programs off of these simple processes on how the brain actually learns and remembers things and how it achieves creativity. But what I think is the most remarkable thing about all of this is how all over the world right now, researchers and technicians and engineers are applying these same principles that I've just told you about to devices and techniques that are going to give function back to those that need it most. Giving paraplegics the ability to walk again, to be able to control robotic arms and robotic devices with just their thoughts. Because think about it, right? If we can use these artificial intelligent programs to read the brain activity and to actually understand it, if we can record directly from someone's motor cortex, 
And we can say, okay, that brain activity means that they want to move their hand in a particular way and grab some type of particular object. That signal can then be programmed into a device for that device to do that for them, for some arm to reach out and grab something. I mean, there's already a DARPA arm that can achieve the same type of articulation and movement and range of motion that the human arm can. And it's just getting the technology to a point where we can read that brain activity successfully. Creating devices that allow us to give deaf people the ability to hear again. Creating the right kind of input in their auditory cortex to give them the perception of sound. Giving blind people the ability to see again. Designing devices that are able to communicate with the visual cortex of the human brain to give them the perception of sight. These technologies are still in their infancy, but we're well on our way. We're on the right track to be able to achieve all of these things. And I think that's more incredible than anything. So I hope you enjoyed this. If you got any value from this video, please hit the like and subscribe button. I plan on making a lot more cool content like this. So I hope you enjoyed and I will see you for the next one.